Hello, I don't know when I'm live, so it's going to take a second. Uh, which is something I've seen other YouTubers do a million times. It's kind of weird for it to be mean. Okay, I think I am live. All right, so here's the deal. My name is Jeremy Sims, uh, and I enjoy teaching people, uh, helping people see things in the Bible uh, that they haven't seen before, not by just making stuff up, but hopefully by, by studying the Bible carefully and uh, looking at, at just interesting things you might overlook at a casual glance. Um, I just did a big long video on Jeremiah 1, um, and uh, it was supposed to be something for people to kind of catch up in a small group and also to help people out, and ended up being... 90 minutes long, uh, which I know is going to be a bit long for most people. So I'm going to try to do a short streamlined version where I am watching the clock and I'm going to shoot for a half hour. I'm pretty good when I'm keeping close eye on things, so hopefully I can do that. Um, if you want a lot more detailed thoughts, like three times as much detailed thoughts, check out that other video. I'm going to leave that up as well. And uh, yeah, so we're going to get into it. So Book of Jeremiah, um, just so you know a little bit of cultural background. Um, this is happening about 600 BC. Um, in, I'm sure everybody's familiar with King David. I have got my video up and it's distracting me. Um, let me see, I need to be on something else. Sorry, this is live, so it's gonna be a little messy, forgive me. All right, so yeah, I'm sorry everybody's familiar with King David. He, the uh, next king was King Solomon. One of King David's kids, Absalom, led to a rebellion. There was a civil war in Israel. Ten of the tribes went north, two of the tribes went south, and they split. The northern tribes were, came to be known as Israel. The southern tribes came to be known as Judah. Things went downhill really quick after the time of Solomon. Both of them started following other gods, and it led to more and more problems. Israel had been carried away when Jeremiah's writing. Uh, at the time Jeremiah's writing, it was about 100 years prior that Israel got so bad that most of, most of them were just taken away into enslavement. Um, they lost control of their own land. Judah uh, was doing slightly better. They had some good kings, um, but it was not good. So, yeah, that, that's kind of the cultural background going on here. Uh, Israel is surrounded by Babylon to the north and east, uh, Egypt to the west, uh, and Assyria to the south, all hostile powers that are kind of tearing them in different directions. Um, and Judah's really just a nobody, um, trying to keep people out of their land, uh, not very successfully. In fact, not even putting up that much of a fight. All right, so let's start studying this chapter, because i got to go quick. Um, Jeremiah 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anaroth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign, it came in the land of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. A lot of stuff in here. Um, let's talk about uh, the son of Hilkiah. It's interesting that Hilkiah is mentioned. Um, could just be a random guy, but I think there's some significance to Jeremiah mentioning that he's the son of Hilkiah. We'll get to that later. We know he's a priest. That means he's part of the religious class. That's a big deal. People who are supposed to minister for the Lord. Uh, in Anathoth, Anathoth was one of the Levitical cities. There were 48 cities uh, spread around between uh, the land of Israel, where the Levites were based, and uh, it kind of spread out the, the ministers of God throughout the entirety of Israel uh, in a way where they'd always be fairly close to, to anybody who needed them. Seems to be one of the ideas. Uh, yeah, so it, it's real close to Jerusalem, only three miles away. So, uh, you know, within commuting distance of um, of the the capital of the entire land, uh, the seat of power. Uh, so, what else we got to, in verse two? To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Okay, who is Josiah? Josiah was a good king. You might remember him from Sunday school as being the boy king. Uh, he took his the throne at age eight. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they had actually lost the word of God, the rules of the covenant, um, back in the day, you know, the printing press wasn't, it wasn't invented and people were generally not following after God. So the actual law had become lost. Well, they were cleaning out the temple one day during Josiah's reign and the high priest found the book of the law. 
um, and they brought it to Josiah. Josiah read it, realized they had violated all of the rules that they were supposed to be following in Israel. And uh, he read his clothes. He was very upset about it. Um, talked to the people of God and found out that um, God basically said, because of your, your attitude, you will be shown a lot of mercy, um, but the nation of Israel is still going to be judged and condemned. Um, and the person who, who, the high priest that found that book of the law, brought it to Josiah, started a, a little bit of a revival of the country, you could say, because Josiah did everything he could to suppress the false gods. Um, that was Hilkiah. All right, as in Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. We don't know definitively it was the same Hilkiah, but everything matches. Most people seem to think it was probably, almost certainly, the same person. So Jeremiah is the son of the high priest, um, somebody close to, to the king. Um, yeah, and then we have these other kings uh, mentioned, Zedekiah uh, and the other one, uh, Jehoiakim. Uh, and they were bad kings. These came after Josiah, and it just went downhill real quick. Uh, things went so poorly for Zedekiah, who was the last king of Judah as an independent as an independent nation, um, that he was actually uh, he he saw the Babylonians took him. Um, they murdered both of his sons in front of his eyes, and then they gouged out his eyes, so it would be the last thing he saw. So that's how dark and grim things got. So think about this. Uh, I know this is. Uh, I feel personally. Well, let's put it this way. Um, Jeremiah was from a religious nation, uh, from religious people. He, his family was religious. Um, and he saw in his day his nation go from relative peace and security and prosperity um, to complete ruin and disaster and slavery. I don't know about you, but that kind of resonates with me. I, I feel like our nation is perhaps headed that way, not necessarily that drastic, but I have very little doubt that we have some judgment coming our way because I feel like we are, are being irresponsible in, in many ways. So, I think judgment is coming, and um, again, don't know how, don't want to be too much of a gloomy rain cloud, but I think this book can, it can be a good roadmap for us to to get some idea of how Christians are supposed to respond in times of judgment. What is our attitude? What is our approach? All right, so moving on. Um, I think, let me check my time. Doo, 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 doo. I gotta watch my stopwatch. Yep, okay. So moving on, verse four. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, uh, we'll read four through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I Pointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and where whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have sent you this day over nations, over kingdoms, to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. All right, so Jeremiah is be bopping around his day, and one day God called him to the ministry, you can say, to use the fancy term, that uh, the nomenclature uh, that uh, my, my particular denomination I grew up in used. Um, but yeah, he, he got this personal encounter with God, He had, uh, which is interesting. You know, he came from a religious family, and yet he had this personal encounter that drew him in, his, in the ministry. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Uh, this definitely speaks of the foreknowledge of God, which there, there are some denominations that are growing some steam. I don't know if they're denominations, but a, a new movement called Open Theism. It's not new, but anyway, open theists actually don't believe God knows everything. This seems to be a pretty good, the fact that he would know, have a mission for a particular person um, before they were ever born. Seems to be pretty good refutation of that, I think. You know, how do you know which sperm and ovum are going to come together to form this exact person if you don't have infinite knowledge? Uh, it's ridiculous to say you can predict that. Um, but anyway, yeah, he has a mission uh, for 
for Jeremiah before he was even born. Uh, a lot of people see this as a pro-life verse, and I think it, it does lend credence to the pro-life position for sure, which the Bible for sure is pro-life. But uh, I think this is a verse that serves that pretty well because it, it talks about there being value and purpose to a person even before uh, they are born or even before they are formed in the womb. All right, so there is meaning, there is value. Uh, yeah, so so he had this calling, he had this mission. Um, he didn't have a choice when he was born or how it, um, you know, what he was called to, but he had a choice how he responded, and thankfully responded relatively well, kind of. Uh, let's look at verse 6. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. Um, now that word, ah, is kind of interesting. Uh, it can be like, ah, or ah, or ah. Um, but actually, this, this word, ah, is actually more of a, ah! <laughs> it's, a it's an exclamation, uh, like, oh me, or oh my, or ah, I'm, not, I'm displeased. Um, so uh, maybe some of us can relate to this, where God's told us something, we kind of have that gut reaction of, oh, okay, and think, think you misspoke there, God. You want to go looking for the other Jeremy Sims. Um, but yeah, he says, I do not know how to speak, uh, for I'm only a youth. Um, didn't, he didn't feel he spoke well. Um, he was a young person. This, this word youth could refer to, basically means adolescent. Um, and there's debate as to how old Jeremiah was. Uh, he did prophesy for a long th time, I think 40 years, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head. Um, so he was almost certainly called when he was young, um, and that seems seems to line up pretty well. Most people say 17 years old, though I, there's no explanation as to why. I, I wasn't able to find an explanation as to why 17 is the age. I saw some people go, you know, a little bit lower and, um, and all the way up to, like, early 20s. Um, so, yeah, but he was young. Um, and let's look at God's response. Uh, but the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, something to know about Jeremiah is that it's, uh, in, it's largely poetry. Uh, and if you use one of the versions of the Bible that, um, that shows things as, uh, you know, breaks things down in paragraphs, you'll see that standing out real well. Anyway, I guess I need to... No, I'm, I'm doing all right on time. Um, yeah, so, so it's kind of interesting, and in the ESV anyway, they, their interpretation has, um, or translation, I should say, uh, takes all the words of God in this little section as being poetic, uh, whereas Jeremiah's are not, so that's kind of interesting. It says, do not say I'm only a youth, for to all, uh, which is interesting. It's like you're, you're, you're in a way making an excuse, but he also he doesn't say that it's not true. God doesn't deny, yeah, you're a youth. And, and he doesn't deny the guy doesn't know how to speak either. That may be the case. Um, but he says, for all to whom I send you, you shall... Uh, but he seems to be saying, hey, I don't want to hear that, and I don't want you to say it. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. For all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether or not you are... Um, whether you have the ability... Uh, it matters whether you're following God and doing what he wants you to do. He'll take care of the rest. Seems to be the pretty clear implication. Um, there's a saying I heard somewhere, I don't know where, of uh, that, that God does, that I think is very true, and that is that God does not um, call the equipped, he equips the called. God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. And I think this is a very good uh, case of that. Um, Verse 8, do not be afraid of them, for I am there with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but, you know, at first it sounds pretty good. Like, oh, God's going to deliver me. That, that's great. Thing is, um, delivery was not perhaps what Jeremiah might have hoped, because he, he had all sorts of horrible things. Uh, he was locked up. He was beaten. He was threatened with death. He was thrown in a well as a prison. Um he saw his whole nation suffer and die. He had almost no friends, from what we can tell. Uh, nobody, or very few people were, were converted by his ministry. He doesn't actually, I think, speak of any explicitly that I know of. Um, he, he died in exile. Uh, it was horrible, horrible. So delivered uh, seems doesn't mean nice things, and that's important for us to get through our heads, um, that... You know, as Americans, we just have this, uh, American Christians, maybe I should specify, we just have this idea of, oh, prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. Well, 
that's not promised to us. So come to terms with that. Uh, it seems to be delivered in the sense that he was delivered from, you know, many prophets were, were killed uh, as soon as they delivered their message, and he was being delivered to serve the purpose that God had for him. Um, verse 9, uh, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. Uh, this is very similar to something that happens with Isaiah. Isaiah says the same thing, I'm not worthy, but in that case, uh, Seraphim takes the coals and puts it to uh, Isaiah's mouth. Um, same thing with Moses, doesn't get touched in the mouth, but God does speak of his mouth, says he'll give him the words for his mouth, and, and he says that he's um, unworthy. Um, I, but yeah, the, uh, well, let's move on and see what God says about that. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant. So it's this idea of, um, yeah, I, I think there's a, a principle here that's saying, yeah, you, you are unworthy. That's, that's correct. <laughs> um, but that's not the issue. I've given you these words. All you have to do is speak them. You know, you don't have to win. You just have to take a stand. Um, it, it's, it's, God's, it's our job to do what God tells us to. It's God's job to make whatever he wants to happen happen from that. Um, so I put my words in your mouth. I've set you this day over the nations and over kingdoms in the sense that he was God's uh, messenger. He was delivering God's words to people. He was speaking in the place of God, in a sense, uh, even though he was not, didn't have any human authority. To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow. These four negative-seeming things, but in a way they're not negative because for anything to be built, you have to destroy some stuff. This house is built on a place that used to not have a house on it. There used to be trees and rocks, and those were torn down, and something better was built on its place. Sometimes, especially when we get real corrupt, God has to pluck up and break down and destroy and overthrow before, the last two parts, he can build and plant. It's a time for reaping, and a time for, or a time for harvesting, and a time for reaping, a time to build, and a time to uh, tear down, a time to to uh, weep and a time to rejoice. There's a time for everything. Uh, and if, if we've been rebelling against God, then our time for weeping and uh, reaping the consequences of that are, are coming, I think. Um, and, and sometimes the bad has to come before the good. Maybe always. All right, verses 11 through 19. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? Uh, and I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north disaster shall be let loose upon the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord. They shall come, and every one shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls all around, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil in forsaking me. Uh, they may have they have made offerings to other gods and worshiped the works of their hands. But you, dress yourself for work, arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the land, kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. All right, a lot to unpack there. And the word, back to verse 11, and the word of the Lord came to me. All right, so this seems to be the idea of a vision. That's what all the commentators say about it, that, that it seems that Jeremiah was having a vision of this sort of thing. And God said, Jeremiah, what do you see? And, I, and he said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. And of course, everybody goes, what in the world is that supposed to mean? So here's the deal. God's actually making a play on words. Um, the, so the he, in Hebrew, the word for almond, um, an almond tree, has the same root word as watching. Same root word as watching. So they're, very, they're closely related terms. Um, specifically, I don't think I have time to look it up, so I have to go from memory since I'm trying to make this real compact. But, but basically it has the idea of um, to be... Uh, the root word has the idea of to be an anticipation of, in uh, looking for, looking out for something. So 
uh, so God's doing this word play. It's like, you sing an almond branch, I'm saying, I'm, I'm watching over this to, to make sure my word comes to pass. It's a promise and kind of a threat. Um, there's also the almond tree is the first one to bloom. Um, out of all the different trees, it's the first one to bloom. It's the first one to bring forth its harvest. So most commentators have the idea that this is um, important because it's it's uh, sorry, I make funny sounds when I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, it's important because it's speaking to like the quick coming nature of God's judgment. Uh, it's the the quickest tree to bloom. It's the the quickness of God's nature. They think there's also that association. I actually think of it a little bit differently, and I, I may be wrong, but just kind of the idea that came to my mind is that, okay, this is the first thing to bloom, but there's a bunch more stuff that's about to bloom. It's like the first thing of the harvest, uh, and people are going to be harvesting the, the, the consequences of their negative actions. The nation's about to do that. There's about to be a bunch of things harvest. This is just the very beginning of spring. Um, this is the first one to bloom, but there's a lot more coming. Get the idea? Uh, that's my take on it, anyway. Regardless, it's a word play for sure, um, and all, yeah. So, um, and you know, well, I don't have time to go further into it than that. We'll leave it there. The word of the Lord came to me a second time, so this seems to be a second vision, saying, "What do you see?" And I said, "I see a boiling pot facing away from the north." Okay, so boiling pot. What is that? Just what it seems like. It's a boiling pot. You use it to kind of seethe. Um, you know, animal parts and stuff, uh, cook yourself stew, whatever, uh, facing away from the north. Now, this is kind of weird. It's facing away from the north. Um, don't, don't boiling pots generally face upwards? <laughs> is that the normal orientation of a boiling pot? I would think so. So what would be facing towards the north? Uh, or facing away from the north, rather, towards the south, coming from the north? Um, well, the idea is that, I think what's being expressed here is the idea that the, the uh, pot is tilted, right? And it's right on the verge, it's still boiling, so it's still got water in it, so it's right on the verge of being poured out. So again, we have this idea of like, it's just about here, guys. Something really big and nasty, of course, burning um, is, is, has associations with God's judgment, clearly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like, it's all right here, guys, get ready. Um, so yeah, out of the North disaster, uh, remember I talked about there being all these hostile kingdoms around, uh, Judah at this point, uh, Babylon was to the east and it controlled all the territory from the east to the north of Judah. Um, so, and, and uh, there was not a good way, there was a desert from the east. So when it says dangers from the north, it's actually talking about Babylon. They would, they would go away from the east, they would go around the desert from the east to the north and then, and then come from north to south. So the judgment is being poured out from the north towards the south. And, and this uh, seething pot is representing it. And, um, you know, as far as why God used this almond branch and, and seething pot, could be that he was trying to give them things that would stick with their memory and then they'd see it throughout their daily life. So it's a really good reminder. Um, Out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon the inhabitants of the Israel. Disaster, this word most literally translated means evil. It can mean calamity or something like that. Um, and this word disaster here is used all throughout the Bible, but it's used a lot in Jeremiah. So this is a key term to be looking out for. Um, evil, disaster, calamity. Uh, it's time of judgment, guys. Um, for them, for sure. Maybe for us, too. Uh, shall be let loose on all the inhabitants of the land. And that word let loose can be the idea of poured out. Um, also, I think it's kind of interesting, this idea of, of letting loose. It's almost like it's always there, but... Like, the danger is always there, but now God's let it go because of his judgment. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north does that, oh, I read that, 15, For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdom of the north, uh, declares the Lord, and they shall come, and everyone shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls, all around, and against all the cities of Judah. So, this is kind of a weird thing. Um, uh... The kingdoms of the north, we know that that refers to Babylon. Um, they shall come and everyone shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. That's kind of weird because you have like gates and you just walk through them. And if you put a big throne in the middle of the gate, that's that's blocking pathways. Why are you doing that? Um, well, that's that's got 
that's the wrong idea there. It's not talking about blocking pathways to the gates, uh, and it's not metaphorical either. It's actually quite literal. Um, so the deal is that the gates of Jerusalem are not your typical gates. They're not just these, you know, archways that you walk through with little, you know, like what you see in the ancient movies where they have the, the little uh, wooden things in the poles keeping them closed from invaders. So they have a wall going out th throughout the whole city. And um, then the, the gates are actually buildings. And they're buildings um, that, rather than have just a straight shot, they actually go in L shape. So you go in one way and then go another way. And, you know, they're not huge, but they're, they're decent-sized building. They're also multiple layered, like there, there are levels to them. So back in the day, the gates of Jerusalem um, were, and, and other cities too, it wasn't just Jerusalem, was the place of power and authority. And that's where big business transactions were made. That's where proclamations from the king would be read. Uh, that's where the court would be held um, in many cases. Jerusalem, uh, or in many cases, um, the kings would even go down and, and you know, adjudicate important matters. Um, in the time of Absalom, the David's rebel son, he actually started going to the gates of Jerusalem and uh, talking to the people and basically trashing his dad and, and saying, you know, if I were the king, I would take care of all this stuff for you. It wouldn't be any injustice in my, my kingdom. Um, so yeah, that's the gates of the kingdom. And now that you're familiar with what that means, um, that comes up in the Bible a lot. So be familiar with that. So uh, when you're talking about, let's go back to that verse. Uh, I will declare my judgment on them for a second. I missed it. I'm sorry. Uh, declares, Lord, they shall come, everyone set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They're talking about taking the positions of power over the city. And that is literal. When Babylon took Jerusalem, they ended up literally the officials, multiple ones, set up their thrones in the gates to take over the city. Against all its walls, all around, and against all the cities of Judah, um, the Babylonian Empire laid siege to Jerusalem. Uh, it was four months that they went without food, so you can only imagine the horror of, of slowly starving to death and, and how the people, no doubt, turned against one another um, when they ran out of food. Uh, really horrible, um, horrible judgment. Uh, and I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil and forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. Um, and in addition to, you know, breaking fellowship with God, uh, just being a bad thing in general, uh, let's keep in mind that there were these philosophies and often child sacrifice and all these horrible things that went along with worshipping these other gods. Um, so, you know, don't... It's a big deal in multiple ways. Um, verse 17, but you dress yourself, but you, speaking to Jeremiah, dress yourself for work, arise and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. Uh, dress yourself for work. Um, you know, men in the, those days wore robes and um, it's hard to do intense labor while you're in robes, right? Because you trip over yourself. So they would... Um, it's called girding up your loins is the, the actual phrase that's there in the Hebrew. Well, anyway, uh, that's more literal translation. And uh, what they do is they basically tie up their robes either by using their belt or just kind of tying it in a knot. And that way you basically turn your robes into shorts so you can get some work done. Um, so Jeremiah is saying, yep, or God saying, yeah, things are, things are going to go bad here. It's time for you to get to work, Jeremiah. Uh, get dressed. Arise and say to them, everything I command you, do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And this idea, dismayed, that word dismayed most literally means to prostrate yourself. Um, it can mean like confounded or, or dismayed or, or whatever. Um, but really it's talking about being, being cowardly. And it's interesting because I don't generally speaking think of cowardice as being a sin. Um, it's just the way I, I think of things. But it is. Uh, it is a sin. Uh, it's actually specifically condemned in the Bible um, multiple times. And I, I think it's important, uh, I mean, this is a pretty, pretty serious uh, statement. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. It's almost like, I'll, I'll give you something to be scared about. Um, that's pretty serious language. Uh, so I think we need to really think about that. I need to think about that because I think, uh, I think honestly, the Christians in general are cowards. I think we're afraid to speak about our faith. I think we're afraid to take hard stands. I think we're afraid of being disliked, of, of losing 
power or prestige or whatever. And uh, I think we're wusses and we need to stop being wusses. And I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to myself. Um, but I suspect I'm talking to a lot of you too. So, so do some soul searching there, I suggest. And see, if, are you really, like if somebody, if God prompted you to witness to somebody at your work or somebody you just saw in a, in a building, would you do it? You know, you go through Walmart and you see somebody, are you, are you going to talk to them? Or you have that, <laughs> okay, well, that's cowardice if you don't act on it. And maybe even if you do, kind of, because you should be bold. Truth is on your side. God is on your side. Um, and I, I know I, I have trouble with that. And I suspect you do, too. And I suspect that's part of the reason we're under judgment. I, I suspect, again, I, I can't tell you God's mindset, but it's just how I feel and think. Um, but I don't speak for God, but I suspect part of it, a big part of judgment is actually because the church isn't doing its job. Big, big part. Um, so yeah, behold, I make, uh, fallen behind my, my goal, I think it'll be a little over half hour, but we'll be close. And I behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, um, its officials, its priests, and the prophets of the land. Um, so this is Jeremiah's job to go up against all the most powerful and prestigious people in the nation. No small task, right? Uh, God, God asks hard things sometimes. Uh, and he gives us this, uh, gives Jeremiah this encouragement. I'll make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls. That's, that's kind of weird. We probably have no idea what that means. A fortified city is pretty evident. That's a good defensive thing. We know what that means. Iron pillar obviously seems solid. It's not going to move, right? Well, the iron pillar specifically was, was what the roofs of the houses were all kind of built upon. It's, it's talking about like the, the uh, central, most important structural column holding up the roof. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, and, and, you know, it's a critical piece, an important piece. And it wasn't always of, of you know, iron, so that's a pretty big deal. Um, bronze walls, that's a real weird one. Um, what does that mean? Well, bronze walls refers to... Um, you think about bricks. Bricks are really good, and, you know, there'd be a lot of stuff made of bricks back in the day, fortifications. I don't know what else they'd use other than bricks for fortifications. Um, but, you know, uh, bricks are not real good at taking impact. They can take a lot of weight, but they can't take a lot of impact. So uh, if somebody had a free access to start slamming on it, they could just straight up break down a wall, right? Well, they'd take bronze plates and put them over the walls if they really wanted to fortify them. That way, the bronze plates would take that, you know, impact and kind of distribute it so it doesn't do that, uh, you know, doesn't break down the wall. It has the benefits of both the metal and the, the brick because uh, you basically layered them. You have layered them. So, yeah, uh, this idea of your, uh, God will make you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Um, that verse has just been really in my mind the last few weeks. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. Uh, you know, this is specifically given to Jeremiah, and we should be careful about applying stuff given to one person to ourselves, but I think even though, you know, this promise wasn't directly given to us, I think it, it uh, in principle, applies uh, I think that is something that, that we can claim. Uh, we don't know. They, they might prevail against us in certain senses, right? But they're not going to get the ultimate uh, win there. I think we really need to think about that. Uh, so here's uh, my, my final closing thought. Uh, and uh, so, so here's a way of viewing things that I think is worthwhile. If we actually believe what we claim to believe as Christians, if you really believe it, really think about it, um, then a million years from now, you will still be alive. You will still be alive. And uh, though I'm sure we'll still be doing something significant in eternity, I don't think we're just playing harps and, and, and watching all our favorite Netflix shows now edited for content. Um, uh, we'll still be doing things that are significant, I have no doubt. Um, but this is, does seem to be a unique period in history where we have a time to affect people's eternal destinations, which obviously is no small thing. So, a million years from now, you're going to be alive, and you're going to be talking to people about 
what happened in your life here on earth and I want you to think about what sort of story you want to tell do you want to say let's say for instance bad times come really even if they don't but let's say bad times come do you want to say yeah there were some, some hard times for Christians when I was alive um, you know I kind of I, I, I actually had a pretty good life I uh, you know I, I still was able to read my Bible and study the Bible and spend some time with Christians I even talked to a few people about God I uh, you know, I, I, I had a lot of fun. I, I, I spent time with my family. I raised a family. Uh, you know, they're, they're pretty good kids. Um, yeah, I, I, I had a lot of fun. I watched a lot of TV. I <laughs> played a lot of video games. Uh, I got a cool car and a nice house. Um, you know, there were, there were tough things. There were, but it, it, it was all right. You know, I, I did fine. Um, would you like that story? Or would you like to say things were bad for Christians? They were. Uh, the whole country was was just leaping off the edge of sanity. Um, things were going really poor, and I fought tooth and nail with everything I had. I gave it all. I just put it all out on the field, and I was such a pain to the world. So so countercultural against where everybody else was going that they despised me entirely. They hated my guts. Um, and they hurt me. They they took away my money. They took away my uh, my freedom. Uh, they tried to shut me up. I, I wasn't. I was not. I, I I had problems. They might have even taken my family. And ultimately, they even killed me. And yet, despite all that, I won. I think I prefer the latter story. And it's easy, relatively, to say not going through it. And I don't know what will happen if we get to that point. But look, guys, if, if we really believe this, then we have the answer for all the problems of the world. Or at least we know the person with the answer. We can be used to affect people's eternal destinations. You have, if you're my age, about 30 to 40 more years to make a difference here. And that's it. And everything else you might want to do, all the Netflix, all the books, all the fun times you can have, all the cool things you can buy, uh, the, the next gun, the next car. If what we, if we actually believe what we say we believe, we have this little window of time to make a difference for things that will resonate in eternity. And then we have all of eternity to do everything else we ever wanted to do. What are we doing with our time? So I think that's something to think about. Anyway, uh, I hope this has been a help to you. And uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. I'll see you guys later. If I and I will close this as soon as I find the appropriate window. I am a bad YouTuber. <gasps> I found it. Bye.